Hi everyone, this is Dr. Harrington again. We're gonna move on to hospice part two, where we will discuss who qualifies for hospice um, and as a physician, how to make a referral. And then we'll conclude with a discussion about the different levels of care for hospice. All right, so this is fairly straightforward. Who qualifies for hospice? So hospice is provided to a patient when the illness has progressed to the point when curative care is no longer desired or beneficial. So the patient has to be certified as being terminally ill by two physicians and having a prognosis of six months or less if the disease runs its normal course. So who are the two physicians? Uh, the first physician can really be anyone. It can be the primary care doctor, it can be uh, the hospitalist, it can be the patient's geriatrician, it really can be any physician. Uh, it can be the first physician and that's usually the physician that places the hospice referral. The second physician is normally the hospice medical director who reviews uh, the patient's notes and uh, request any kind of additional documentation and, and usually the hospice medical director serves as the second physician. So when I see a patient, um, I have to look at the patient, look at the disease course, and figure out a prognosis. If I believe if the, pa if the disease runs its natural course, this patient has six months or less, then the patient qualifies for hospice. There's not a long list of check boxes or other uh, guidelines or qualifications. It's really two physicians saying if this disease runs its natural course, the patient has six months or less. So again, uh, looking at the Medicare guidelines, certification of terminal illness, quote, shall be based on the physician physicians or medical directors clinical judgment regarding the normal course of the individual's illness. Now the goal for the patient should be comfort. Um, if a patient wants to keep going back and forth to the hospital, if they want to continue to get tests or procedures or workups or very aggressive care, they really don't meet uh, the hospice philosophy and don't qualify for hospice. The goal has to be comfort and providing good quality care at the end of life. So prognosis less than six months, two physicians, and the goal has to be comfort at the end of life. So let's talk a little bit about prognostication. Absolutely, we know that it's difficult. There are a lot of tools available. Um, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, the NH NHPCO, has a set of hospice guidelines. Again, they're guidelines, they're not requirements. So if you want to take a look at what the NHPCO has as guidelines for um, in-stage heart disease or in-stage lung disease, um, those can be helpful. Um, sometimes they are not helpful for every particular particular situation. Um, most of the time physicians have to use their clinical judgment. For me, I look at the disease course and the rate of decline. One thing that is really helpful uh, is to look for patients' functional status, their PO intake or nutritional status, and their mental status. And then we, uh, I will talk a little bit about patterns of disease progression. So some diseases have uh, very predictable patterns, others do not. Um, if I have two patients with metastatic lung cancer um, and one is walking around eating three meals a day and their mental status is clear, that patient has a much better prognosis than someone who is bed bound, who has stopped eating and who is confused. So I'd always look at function, PO intake and mental status as part of trying to get a, a good picture about prognosis. These are some diagrams about patterns of end-stage disease. Um, does everyone fall neatly into one of these? Of course not, but um, there are some diseases that do have a pattern close to the end of life. So if you look at time being on the x-axis and clinical function um, on the y, for patients who are going to die of their end-stage, usually solid tumor cancer, um, uh, Hematologic malignancies are a lot more unpredictable, but for a metastatic solid tumor cancer, patients will usually have a pretty high functional status and go for quite a while until there's a pretty rapid decline at the end of life. And this can take place between 
having a pretty normal function to being at the end of life over the course of a few weeks. So this happens very, very rapidly. So when I have a patient um, who I normally see in clinic and who misses an appointment, we always call their family. And if the wife says, you know, he was doing fine last week, but now he just can't get out of bed. He's sleeping all the time. He's not eating. And we're just seeing a real um, rapid change. That is, uh, that gives me some signals that, that we may be close to the end of life. And having, um, having a cancer patient trying to figure out prognosis for them and when is hospice the right time is not terribly difficult because it's such a rapid decline. Now, congestive heart failure and COPD, some of these chronic illnesses, much more difficult. So the pattern we see here is the patient um, has a pretty moderate functional status and then is interrupted by these acute exacerbations. So an acute COPD exacerbation and acute CHF exacerbation. And many times they will recover, but not quite to the level they were before, and we'll see kind of a slow decline. And some of these exacerbations can very much be very close to death, and patients bounce back. And usually the last exacerbation, they just can't bounce back. Their bodies don't have any reserve. So this pattern can happen over the course of years. So figuring out prognosis for CHF or COPD, very, very difficult. Also difficult is end-stage dementia. So often having a much lower functional status and just very, very, very slowly um, dwindling um, at the end of life. And again, this can happen over the course of years. So um, CHF, COPD, dementia, much more difficult to prognosticate. Um, so oftentimes I will come back to function and PO intake and nutrition and mental status um, to help with that prognostication. Okay, so how to make a referral. Um, the first thing you've got to do is talk to the patient uh, or the family about hospice care. And yeah, these, this is uh, my advice on how to do that. The first step is actually breaking the bad news, having a prognosis discussion with the patient or the family. And you can use your spikes protocol that we've talked about in the past. Essentially, you are going to be sharing that you think is time is short for this patient and we need to figure out goals of care. The next step is to ask, you know, what are the goals? What are your goals? Knowing that time is short, what is important to you? And then I usually ask, you know, what are the patient's needs at home? Then I can recommend hospice as a way to help that patient meet those goals and needs. This approach goes a whole lot better than just walking into a patient's room and saying, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about a hospice. That usually doesn't go very well. So step one, breaking the bad news, time is short. What are your goals, knowing that time is short? And you know, a lot of patients will say, I'd like to be home, I'd like to be out of the hospital, I'd like to spend time with my family, um, I'd like to be out of pain. Um, and what are your needs at home? Um, oftentimes families will tell me this, well, we need a hospital bed, we need oxygen, we need different things. And then I can come and say the best way that I know how uh, to help you meet those goals and to provide for your needs is with hospice care is it okay if I talk to you about what hospice might have to offer? So this is the best way to approach it. All right, so the actual referral, it needs to be a physician order. It's very, very simple. Um, a physician order, usually um, you've got to distinguish between is this an outpatient consult versus an inpatient consult. So an outpatient consult would be things like providing hospice in the patient's home. The order has to have the hospice diagnosis, and it's got to have somewhere on it that you, the physician, believe that the patient's prognosis is less than six months. The other thing I, I would like to encourage you is to consider an informational visit, and this is a visit 
where it may not quite be time for hospice or the patient's not quite ready for hospice, but you can frame it as an informational visit. You may need hospice down the road. Would it be okay if someone from hospice came to visit with you and your family and provided information for when you need it down the road? And this is really helpful because um, it, it makes hospice not so scary for a lot of patients. They, they get to meet the nurses. They come out to their house, um, they leave information with families, they answer questions, and then when it is actually time for hospice care, they already have a name and a face. Um, they've already been thinking about it and talking about it. So um, you can always call a hospice and say this patient would like an informational visit. So that's always acceptable too. Okay, I am going to share another screen. and go through what an outpatient uh, referral looks like. So this is, a, this is not a real patient. Here's a, a test patient in Epic, and this is really easy. Let's say I've got a patient that I see in clinic and we've talked about goals of care, and I would uh, like to uh, place a hospice order. Uh, for home hospice. So usually if you're in any kind of electronic medical record, you can easily find the hospice order. So this one's ambulatory referral to hospice. Okay, so this is a referral out of my clinic. All right, it's very easy. We're going to write some comments in here. So this is a 60-year-old male with I mean, that's really it. This is not terribly difficult. Um, if you've got a patient that you want to um, communicate with the hospice, if they need something special, um, I can always do it here. Uh, patient requesting a uh, hospital bed and home O2. Okay, but really all you need in a hospice referral is the diagnosis and the prognosis. That is it. Okay, and so now I'm signing it, at least in clinic. I try to, um, I try to print it and um, And then we fax it to the hospice with a face sheet. Okay, so we're going to stop that share and go back to our All right, so we're back to our module. All right, the, the other thing that I'd like to point out is how important it is to talk about goals of care first. You have to discuss goals of care with the patient and the family. Don't ever just send hospice as a surprise to come to the patient's house. You have to have a goals of care conversation. Um, and the family or the patient really do need to be on board with the hospice philosophy. The hospice philosophy is comfort care at the end of life. After you discuss goals and everybody's on the same page, then you can discuss needs and hospice services. If you lead the conversation with, here are all these great services that hospice provides, every patient wants those. I, I can't imagine a patient would turn that down. Wait, a nurse will come to my house and you'll pay for my medicines and my equipment. Of course I want those services. Um, but that can lead to a lot of conflict down the road. So you actually have to talk about goals first, services second. So you can be completely honest about what hospice is and what services it provides. All right, finally, we're going to talk about levels of care. So once a patient enrolls in hospice, they are eligible to receive hospice in all of these different levels of care. Most patients 
who are enrolled in hospice receive routine home care. So this is a set of services that are brought to the patient's home to care for them at the end of life. And home is defined as where the patient lives. Can be a freestanding home, can be an assisted living, can be a nursing home. So home is where the patient lives. And these are routine home care services that we'll talk about in the next module. Um, I would say that about 90% of patients receive routine home care services. Patients are also eligible once they enroll in hospice for general inpatient hospice, or sometimes you'll hear it with GIP bed, a GIP bed. So GIP hospice is usually a freestanding building. Sometimes it's a, a leased wing of a hospital um, where patients can get around the clock hospice care from nurses and doctors. And this is not for everyone. Patients who qualify for GIP hospice are patients for whom symptoms cannot be managed at home. If symptoms are minimal or they can be managed at home, patients do not uh, are not eligible for GIP hospice. Um, so somewhere around you know five to ten percent of patients um, receive care in a general inpatient hospice. Most patients are, are here routine home care. Patients are also eligible for respite care. So this is up to five days of care outside of the patient's home. So this could be in a nursing home, this could be in a, in a general inpatient hospice facility where patients um, don't qualify for GIP. So they have well-managed symptoms, but they can come for up to five uh, continuous days of respite care. So sometimes we'll use this when families just need a break. Families are going on vacation. Um, someone else is sick in the family and we need to, to uh, transfer that patient to an inpatient hospice for respite care. And finally, uh, hospice covers something called continuous care. Now this is for very, very rare circumstances. Um, I've been practicing for 12 years and have used this twice. Um, so this is for patients who stay at home and need continuous nursing care at the bedside. So I'll give you an example. I had a patient with metastatic breast cancer with brain meds who wanted to die at home. She made everybody promise that we would not send her to a nursing home. She never wanted to go to an inpatient hospice. She wanted to die at home. Well, close to the end of life, she started having seizures from her uh, brain meds. And uh, we decided to use continuous care so we could honor her wish to die at home. And in that case, we were able to get nurses to do eight hour shifts for about 36 hours to be at the bedside while we started an Ativan drip. Um, there's no way I could have started an Ativan drip without a nurse um, at the patient's bedside titrating. So once you enroll in hospice, you are eligible for all of these different levels of care and patients can easily go in between uh, from one to the other. So for example, if a patient starts at home with hospice receiving routine home care and then develops symptoms that can't be managed at home, I can easily transfer them to a GIP hospice bed. Or if I have a patient whose family needs a break, I can start here, routine home care, transition um, and get respite care up to five days. Um, there are times uh, for those of you who practice at the hospital where we we discharge a patient from the hospital to a general inpatient hospice unit. We get their symptoms tuned up at the GIP hospice bed and then send them home with hospice. So again, once you enroll under the umbrella of hospice, um, patients can go uh, between different levels of care. All right, so what we've reviewed in this uh, course module, we've talked about patients who qualify for hospice. These are patients for two doctors uh, using your clinical judgment. If the disease runs its natural course, we believe this patient has six months or less to live. Um, a hospice referral always starts with a goals of care discussion. Um, and the goal really needs to be comfort care at the end of life. We talked about how to replace to how to place a referral, and that includes um, 
uh, writing down the patient's hospice diagnosis and the fact that they've got less than six months to live. Then we reviewed different levels of care, routine home care, which is what most people receive. Um, there are options for general inpatient hospice for symptoms that can't be controlled at home, um, respite care, and continuous care. All right, thank you very much.